Let me read from Job 4.14. Fear came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form of it. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he puts no trust in his servants, and his angels he charges with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth, they are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Isaiah twenty four seventeen. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that comes out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. Now, if you remember last week, we discussed that Christian and hopeful had spent some time by a river that gave them a good amount of pleasure and peace and comfort. And they headed down the path, which you can see close to the top of the second column of that map that I gave you, if you have that map. But the river went off to the right, and to the left was a place called Bypath Meadow. And as the way began to get more difficult, hard on their feet, and they got sore, they were looking for an easier way. And Christian saw the path off to the left and a stile that allowed them to go there, and it was parallel to the path that they were on. And they thought, well, this is safe enough. At least Christian thought so, though I think Hopeful had a good deal of reluctance. But they crossed over the stile. They're heading on this way, and before them they see a person called Vain Confidence. What was interesting about Vain Confidence is, unlike other characters in Pilgrim's Progress that they came across, they interrogated them, buy-ins and his companions and so on. In the case of Vain Confidence, they didn't ask a lot of questions. But what I wanted to establish at the end of that class before we get into the castle of giant despair was, is there a necessary correlation, an exact correlation between the declension and the choices that they had taken and the beating that was laid upon them by the giant in the castle of giant despair? And I established it, unlike some of the commentators, I don't think you want to draw an exact correlation. Some of the things that uh, they said prior to going over into Bypath Meadows, they said, but the river and the way for a time parted at which they were not a little sorry. This is a narrator. Yet they dared not go out of the way. So at this point, they're very cautious. Later on, they said, Christian said to Hopeful, who could have thought that this path should have led us out of the way? So immediately when they see what happened to vain confidence that he perished, Hopeful asked Christian about what's going on here, and Christian was so shocked he knew he had probably made a wrong decision. He wasn't able at first to answer him, and then he said, who could have thought that this path should have led us out of the way? Later on, he said, good brother, be not offended. I am sorry I have brought you out of the way and that I have put you into such imminent danger. Pray, my brother, forgive me. I did not do it of an evil intent therein because by my means we are both gone out of the way. So in other words, as they see what's happened to them, he's very sorrowful. He says, because of what I have done, we have both gone out of the way. So I see in this that though they did go on the wrong path and wanted an easier way, that there was immediate sorrow and recollection of what they had in fact done. In the castle dungeon, Christian had, quote, double sorrow because it was through his unadvised counsel that they were brought into this distress. 
And I was thinking about this, and last week I quoted Zechariah 7.11, and if you want to look at it in your Bible, this is an interesting couple of verses because it is a commentary on what it is to, in fact, go out of the way. In verse 11 it says, But they refused to heed, they shrugged their shoulders, and the King James, they pulled away their shoulders, the Hebrew word actually means their shoulders became refractory, meaning obstinate. In our day, we would say they became pig-headed. And they stopped their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint or an adamant, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Thus, thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. And the reason I put this emphasis there is because if you've ever had to assist people, uh, counsel them, trying to comfort them, who are keenly aware of the mistakes that they've made in their Christian pilgrimage, and great trials have come into their life, it's important that we're very careful to keep them from making an exact corollary between these very, very difficult trials and some wrongdoing that they've done in their life, it doesn't necessarily follow. Saying that he was kind of at the end of his... And I'm going to develop this in an amazing story before the end of this hour about a pastor named Simon Brown who lived from 1680 to 1732 who lived in the castle of giant despair from early in his ministry to the end of his life. It's an amazing story, and I'll save that for later. But, and question 150 of the larger catechism, to more nail the thing closed, are all transgressions, transgressions of the law of God, equally heinous in themselves? Answer, all transgressions of the law of God are not equally heinous. So it depends upon who they are done against, the aggravations, some are more heinous, and so on. So it depends upon your profession, your time in the way, gifts, place, office, guides to others, and whose example is likely to be followed by others. From the parties offended, if immediately against God, his attributes and worship against Christ and his grace, the Holy Spirit, his witness and workings, against superiors, men of eminency and such as we stand, especially related and engaged to, against any of the saints, particularly weak brethren, the souls of them or any other, and the common good of all or many. Now here's the key. From the nature and quality of the offense, if it be against the express letter of the law, breaks many commandments, contains in it many sins, if not only conceived in the heart, but breaks forth in words and actions, scandalizing others, and admits of no reparation, if it's done against means, mercies, judgments, light of nature, conviction of conscience, public or private admonition, censors of the church, and so on. So there is an aggravation of sin in the sinner. So we want to, we don't have a lot of commentary. We have Bunyan's words. And what little commentary we have is the poem that he typically writes at the end of each section. So I'm saying that this is a far cry different thing than what we read in Zechariah 11. But that this does in fact happen to Christians, what happened in the castle of giant despair, which we'll read the narrative in a second, I do want to establish. And I'll start by reading part of a sermon by Jonathan Edwards. I made mention of the sermon, and this sermon is very, very helpful on this point. It's taken out of Hosea chapter 2. Edwards wrote, souls are apt to be brought into trouble before God bestows true hope and comfort if God has a design of mercy to them. It is his manner before he bestows true hope and comfort on them to bring them into trouble, to distress them and spoil their ease and false quietness, and to rouse them out of their old resting and sleeping places. And to bring them into a wilderness, they are brought into trouble and sometimes into exceedingly great trouble and distress so that they can take no comfort in those things in which they used to take comfort. Their hearts are pinched and stung and they can find no ease in anything. 
they have, as it were, an arrow sticking fast in them, which causes grievous and continual pain, an arrow which they cannot shake off or pull out. The pain and anguish of it drinks up their spirit. Their worldly enjoyments were a sufficient good before, but they are not now. They wander about with wounded hearts, seeking rest and finding none, like one wandering in a dry and parched wilderness under the burning, scorching heat of the sun, seeking for some shadow where he may sit down and rest, but finding none. Wherever he goes, the beams of the sun scorch him, or he seeks some fountain of cool water to quench his thirst, but finds not a drop. He is like David in his trouble who wandered about in the wilderness, Saul pursuing him wherever he went, driving and hunting him from one wilderness to another, from one mountain to another, and from one cave to another, giving him no rest. To such sinners all things look dark. If they know not what to do nor where to turn, if they look forward or backward, to the right hand or to the left, all is gloom and perplexity. If they look to heaven, behold darkness. If they look to the earth, behold trouble and darkness and dimness of anguish. Sometimes they hope for relief, but they are disappointed. So again and again they travel in pain, and a dreadful sound is in their ears. They are terrified and affrighted, and they seek refuge as a poor creature pursued by an enemy. He flees to one refuge, and there is beset, and that fails, and he flies to another, and then is driven out of that. And his enemies grow thicker and thicker about, encompassing him on every side. They call on God, but he does not answer nor seem to regard them. Sometimes they find something in which they take pleasure for a little time, but it soon vanishes away and leaves them in greater distress than before. And sometimes they are brought to the very borders of despair. Thus they are brought into the wilderness and into the valley of Achor, or of trouble. That sermon is called... True repentance usually follows genuine humiliation. So Pilgrim's Progress says, Christian and Hopeful could not with all the skill they had get back to the stile that night, therefore they finally found refuge under a little shelter. They sat down there till the break of day, but being weary they fell asleep. Now this is an allegory, and it needs to be established that falling asleep and going back to the stile when you're trying to get out of the wrong way is a sign that their way is not good. Not far from the place where they lay, there was a castle called Doubting Castle. The owner of it was Giant Despair, and it was on the grounds they now slept. And so early in the morning when the giant got up and walked up and down in his fields, he caught Christian and hopeful asleep on his property. With a grim, surly voice, a giant ordered them to wake up, and he asked, Where are you from, and where are you going on my property? Or what are you doing on my property? The two explained they were pilgrims who had lost their way. Then giant despair said, You have trespassed against me by trampling upon and lying on my grounds. Therefore you must come along with me. So Christian and Hopeful were forced to go with the giant because he was stronger than them. As they walked along, they had very little to say, for they recognized their current circumstances were their fault. The giant drove them ahead of himself and eventually secured them in a very dark dungeon in his castle. The spirits of the two prisoners found the dungeon to be nasty and stinking. But here they lay from Wednesday morning until Saturday night without receiving one bit of bread or drop to drink. They remained in the dark all that time, so no one even came to ask how they were. Robert McGuire on this says, What a progression of disaster from the easy style and tempting meadowland through the bypath of an unbidden departure from the road the pilgrims go on from bad to worse until they find themselves in the strong captivity of doubt and under the grinding tyranny of despair, Christian had seen a representation of the spiritual woe in the iron cage in the interpreter's house. He had experienced much of its gloom and misery in his own person in the valley of death. And now he is appointed to pass through another season of horror and great darkness in the dungeons of despair, aggravated by the thought that he and his comrade had but themselves to blame for the transgression which had brought them there. In my handout, and I won't go into it in detail, it's a very helpful book, but it's just an outline I did of chapters 3 and 4 of the uh, Child of Light Walking in Darkness. 
I'll just give you a quote from that, walking in darkness and having no light. First, the immediate light of his countenance, which is a clear evident beam and revelation of God's favor, immediately testifying that we are his, which is called a testimony of the spirit. By the way, um, we want to be very careful at this point with Thomas Goodwin because his, uh, when he talks about testimony of the spirit, he's usually referring to Ephesians 1, 13, and Thomas Goodwin's view of that was the same as uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones that I told you about last week in Romans 8, 16, for the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. So he may be talking about something a lot more subjective, which is not, um, I believe, is carefully commented on, and uh, others as well, which have looked at Goodwin's writings, but the thing that David desired more than all worldly things, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon me. When this is totally withdrawn, then a man is said to have no light. Such was Jonah's case. I am cast out of your sight, he says. And so God, God dealt with David often, and sometimes a long time together, and so on. So let's move on in the uh, story. Now, Giant Despair had a wife, and her name was Diffident. So when the giant went to bed that evening, he told his wife that what he had done. Now, the word diffidence, as it's being used in this context, uh, you could call her mistrust. Diffidence, she doesn't trust anything, you know, like Pilate, what is true? Explaining that he had taken a couple of prisoners and thrown them into his dungeon for trespassing on his grounds. And he asked for advice. What do you think I should do with these prisoners tomorrow? Well, who are they? She asked. And where did they come from? He told her. And she advised him that when he arose in the morning, he should beat them without mercy. So when he arose in the morning, he grabbed his dreadful crab tree club or cudgel and went to the prisoners. He began to beat them as if they were misbehaving dogs, although he, they had shown him no disrespect. The giant continued to beat them so severely that they were no longer able to try to protect themselves or even to move upon the floor. Once he had finished, the giant walked out and left them there to commiserate over their misery and to mourn under their distress. So for the rest of the day, heavy sighs and bitter cries occupied their time. You have to study what's going on in Christian's mind during this time because remember he had already fought with Apollyon valiantly, valiantly, and he had gotten through the valley of the shadow of death, but added to their present trial is guilt, which adds to the stress and sometimes is accompanied by temporal despair. Uh, this just came to my mind, but I remember uh, reading uh, in The Forgiveness of Sin by John Owen. If you start that work, there is a paraphrase of Psalm 130. And in his paraphrase, you know, he's enlarging, he's amplifying the verses of Psalm 130, but he says, I dare not utterly despond or despair, because that works, it militates against faith. So Goodwin says, first, for God's spirit, although he has a hand in some part of this disquietness, yet we must take heed how we put upon him any of those doubts and desperate fears of the wrath of God. For the spirit is not the direct or positive cause of them. One thing I notice if you read Goodwin is his preciseness. If you know anything about Goodwin, he was not only a Westminster divine, he lived from 1600 to 1680. He also was one of the members of the Savoy Committee who put together the Savoy Declaration. So he has a very precise theological mind. And I always got a kick out of this because when we go through, I think it was our study of the canons of Dort, it may have been the confession, when Pastor Nichols refers to the men of the Savoy Committee, he calls them John Owen and the Independents. And that name, I just couldn't get it out of my mind. I said, well, you got a rock band? So I decided this is years ago, I would create an album for John Owen and the Independence, Savoy Bound. So the spirit may reveal God is angry with a man for such and such sins and make him sensible of them. 
not barely by concealing his love, but by making impressions of his wrath upon his conscience. So Isaiah and I says, I, hide, I hid me and was wroth, and this is expressed, my wrath by hiding myself, but I smote him and was wroth. He contended and was wroth. This is um, it's in Isaiah 63.10, and this was his wrath upon his spirit. I guess I did write John Owen down here. This is uh, what he says in uh, Psalm, 30, Psalm 130, verses 1 and 2, his paraphrase. O Lord, through my manifold sins and provocations, I have brought myself into great distresses. Mine iniquities are always before me, and I'm ready to be overwhelmed with them as with a flood of tears, for they have brought me into depths wherein I'm ready to be swallowed up. But yet... Although my distress be great and perplexing, I do not, I dare not utterly despond and cast away all hopes of relief or recovery. That is so helpful. I mean, because fixed despair so militates against any kind of faith that enables you to get out of this dungeon and the giant's castle. So the next night, Diffidence talked with her husband again about the prisoners. I get a kick out of that. You ever notice how wicked people have great marriages? I mean, the giant and his wife, uh, Ahab and Jezebel. I think sometimes the enemy doesn't attack them like he does us. When she learned that they were still alive, she advised her husband to recommend a Christian and hopeful that they commit suicide. In the morning, he went to the prisoners in the same gruff manner as before. When he saw they were in extreme pain because of the wounds he had inflicted the day before, he told them, since you are never likely to get out of this place, your best alternative is to make an end of yourselves. You can use a knife, noose, or poison. I don't know where they were going to get poison down there. For why should you choose to live seeing life is filled with so much bitterness? The prisoners asked that he let them go. With that, the giant scowled as if he were ready to rush upon them to finish them off right then and there. But he fell into one of his fits, for he sometimes experienced seizures on sunshiny days, during which he lost the use of his hands for a time. Therefore, he withdrew from the dungeon and left the prisoners to consider what they should do. Christian and Hopeful talked between themselves as to whether it would be best to take the giant's advice or not, and it led into an intense conversation. Brother, said Christian, what shall we do? The life we now live in this place is miserable. For my part, I don't know whether it is better to live like this or to die by our own hand. That's language that Christian never used in any of his previous trials. My soul chooses strangling rather than life. He's quoting Job, and the grave seems more desirable for me than this dungeon. And my soul thought it better to be strangled and desired death more than my bones, Job 7.15. Shall we accept the giant's advice? So I was reading this week to refresh my memory about the life of William Cooper. When I was uh, being interviewed on the radio program, Iron sharpens iron. And I was talking about uh, bibliography of Puritans and spiritual depression and spiritual desertion. You have to field calls as they come in. And I was asked, do you believe that a Christian commit, can commit suicide? And I said, I'm not going to go there. I said, I just don't have enough light. And uh, But I will say this, that um, the Puritans were a lot more adamant on this subject than we are in our day. And I think in this case, it's because we so understand human physiology and so on. I think we're more charitable, but I refuse to be dogmatic. But it says in the life of Cooper, now came the grand temptation, the place to which Satan had all the while been driving me, the dark and hellish purpose of self-murder. I grew more sullen and reserved, fled from all society, even from my most intimate friends, and shut myself up in my chambers. The ruin of my fortune, the contempt of my relations and acquaintance, the prejudice I should do my patron were all urged on me with irresistible energy. So you could see the suggestions of the devil in this. I began to be reconciled to the apprehension of death. 
Though formerly in my happiest hours I had never been able to glance a single thought that way without shuddering at the idea of dissolution, I now wished for it and found myself but little shocked at the idea of procuring it myself. Perhaps thought I, there is no God, or if there be, the scriptures may be false. If so, then God has nowhere forbidden suicide. I considered life as my property, therefore at my own disposal. Men of great name, I observe, had destroyed themselves, and the world still retained the profoundest respect for their memories, end quote. I mean, how low do you have to go in your introspection, in your melancholy, in your depression to communicate things like this, but above all, I was persuaded to believe that if the act were ever so unlawful, and even supposing Christianity to be true, my misery in hell itself would be more supportable, end quote. Um, when John Newton, um, who lived at the same time as Cooper, and Cooper lived with the Newtons for an extended period of time, in order to assist Cooper through this, they designed a hymnal together called the Only Hymnal, and... Uh, Cooper would write a poem, and Newton would write a poem, and Cooper would write a poem, but Cooper ended in the 60th poem and then went into complete spiritual depression um, four times in his life. It was so extensive and was never able to write another hymn. So a free verse that he wrote, just to give you an idea of how low he had gotten, hatred and vengeance, my eternal portion, scarce can endure delay of execution. Wait with impatient readiness to seize my soul in a moment. Damn below Judas, more abandoned than he was, who for a few pence sold his holy master. Twice betrayed, Jesus, me the last delinquent, deems him profanous. And I won't even read on because it's so... Almost depressing, but what's so amazing is you compare that to his mind, his genius. And Newton said that he did not have the genius that William Cooper did for poetry. But listen, you know these words, ye fearful saints. Fresh courage take, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy, and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So, in Pilgrim's Progress, Hopeful let out a thoughtful sigh. It is true that our present condition is dreadful, and death would be far more welcome to me than to live in this continual misery. However, let us consider what the Lord of the country to which we are going has said. He declares you shall not commit murder, not just to another man's person, but we are forbidden to take the giant's advice to kill ourselves as well. Also, let us consider again... The giant despair does not have authority over the law of our Lord. As far as I can understand, others have been captured by him just like we have, and yet they have escaped out of his hands. Who knows if God, perhaps, the God that made the world might cause the giant to despair or die, or that perhaps at some time or another in the future he may forget to lock us in. We learn a couple things from this, the more buoyant temperament of hopeful, Somewhat the more conscience clear, but throughout the rest of the book, Hopeful is a very helpful companion to Christian when Christian gets down. First it was Christian assisting Hopeful when the temptation was near, and now we see the roles reverse in the helpfulness of this younger Christian to his brother he says, or that he may in the near future have another paralyzing fit, the giant, while he, while he is here with us in the dungeon and then lose the use of his limbs. If that should ever come to pass again, for my part, I'm determined to bolster my courage and to muster all my effort to escape from his hand. I was a fool not to have tried to do it earlier. However, my brother, let us be patient and continue to endure. The opportunity may come that could provide us with a happy release, but it shall not be by our own murders. George Cheever says, now we're Christian and hopeful in a dreadful case, deep down in darkness, the bars of the earth and of death around them, no food, no drink, no light, no comfort. The weeds were wrapped about their head. 
That's interesting because that's a reference to what happened to Jonah in the belly of the fish. And last week I had read you Hugh Martin's comments on that. I didn't know at the time that Cheever also made reference to Jonah's agony in the belly of the well. And in this dungeon they cried as out of the belly of hell, bemoaning themselves to one another with groans and lamentations. Hopeful continues hopeful even in despair. Christian at one time abandons all hope and listens seriously to the giant's infernal temptations to self-destruction. Hopeful had not fallen so far as Christian, for Christian had been the more eminent and experienced pilgrim of the two and had also led his fellow astray. But this did not make all the elastic than Christians. He was of a more joyous temperament, that's hopeful, and more apt to look on the bright side, not so deep, grave, and far-sighted as Christian and not capable in any case of quite such deep trials of feeling. Hopeful spirit soon rose again, but Christian, when he is down on account of sin, is brought even to the gates of hell. How affectingly instructive are Hopeful's arguments with Christian to dissuade him from suicide. Doubtless good men have been tempted in this way, but strange enough, it seems that a sense of God's wrath and desertion on account of sin should tempt a man to plunge deeper into such wrath, nay, to incur it past redemption. I had a couple more quotes, but I want to get this single paragraph in from Henry Gouger, who was in prison with Adoniram Judson in Burma, because they were able to write so much, um, with so much power and the command of the English language in the early 1800s. And Gouger says, one would think from the course of events which I have endeavored to describe their time in prison, that it was not easy to add to the weight of our troubles, nor from the circumscribed intercourse which it was possible for us to hold with the outer world, did there seem much reason to fear that any fresh crime could be imputed to us. I have before remarked, however, that there is no lot which man has to sustain in this life so wretched that it is incapable of becoming worse. In our discontented imaginations, we may think we have reached the bottom of the pit and be disposed to defy fate to make us more completely miserable, but in this we are mistaken. Some unlooked-for mischance sends us still lower and shows us that no line can sound the depths of the calamities to which human life is liable. I found this, and this is just a real quick reference because I check all books on the from the Post Reformation Digital Library and I was telling you the Puritans and how thorough that they were. This is a book of 832 pages published in 1659. That's the what the fifth edition. 832 pages of temptations. So he draws out what temptations were liable to against each of the Ten Commandments and on the right is self Murther, self-murder, suicide. So they were pretty adamant. They were pretty dogmatic that 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 was a sin that would damn you. And I don't want to be that dogmatic. But the case of Simon Brown is so interesting because um, Simon Brown was a dissenting minister and theologian. He was born in Somerset, England in 1680. Brown was preached was preaching by the age of 20, and first became a minister at an independent church in Portsmouth before moving in 1716 to preach at the old jewelry meeting house in London, and he published a volume of his sermons in 1722, and also a collection of hymns. I, I found the titles of 57 of them online, and spiritual songs, Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, and so on. But he was, in his youth as a pastor, I say youth, he was in his 20s. He was attacked by a highway robber, and in order to preserve his life, he killed the robber. He killed him in self-defense. Although he faced no legal consequences for this act, Brown was convinced that he had used excessive force and had thus become a murderer. This is a living in the castle of giant despair through no fault of your own. He developed a belief that due to his act of murder, he had become eternally 
damned and that his soul had been removed from his body. It's an amazing idea. It uh, was recorded in the Edinburgh Magazine for 1762. This delusion, which is close as we can tell, in 1880 was labeled the Codard, Codard Syndrome. But listen to this, just a quote from his letter that he wrote to somebody. I doubt not you. You have been earnest with God on my behalf since you left the city. And he talks about his state. He thought that he was damned and no longer possessed a soul and was living on the common level of brutes. He says that he is destitute, entirely destitute of the knowledge of God and Christ and his own soul and the things both of time and eternity. Being, being unable to look forward or backward, or inward, or outward, or upward, or downward, having no conviction of sin or duty, no capacity of reviewing my conduct, or looking forward with expectation of either good or evil, and in a word, without any principles of religion or even of reason, and without the common sentiments or affections of human nature, and sensible even to the good things of life, and so on, and so on. And he says, this is my true condition. Thus I am thrown down from my excellency because I had not. God has taken away the things that I had. And I think that this is a totally erroneous conclusion. But what's so remarkable about this man is that his mind was still so excellently intact that he still wrote books. He was such an excellent disputant against the uh, enemies of Christianity that some people said though he thought that he didn't possess a soul it seemed more like he possessed two of them because he was such a powerful debater and he even had written books after this but this is what really really amazed me if you most of you know about Matthew Henry's commentary and the full version of that commentary is six volumes Matthew Henry died before that commentary was complete, um, 1721, 1714, I think is when Matthew Henry passed away, but he had only completed it up to the book of Acts. So from Romans to Revelation, that commentary is completed by the students of Matthew Henry, and one of them was Simon Brown. In this condition, this guy actually finished the notes of Matthew Henry on 1 Corinthians. So the guy was still a voluminous writer. Simon Brown's friends often urged him to account for this change in his conduct at which they expressed the utmost grief and astonishment. And after much importunity, he told them that he had fallen under the sensible displeasure of God who had caused his rational soul gradually to perish and left him only an animal life in common with the brutes, that it was therefore profane for him to pray and incongruous to be present at the prayers of others. In this opinion, however absurd, he was inflexible at a time when all the powers of his mind subsisted in their full vigor, when his conceptions were clear and his reasoning strong, being once importuned to say grace at the table of a friend. He excused himself many times, but the request being still repeated and the company kept standing, he discovered evident tokens of distress. And after some irresolute irresolute gestures and hesitation expressed with great fervor this ejaculation, this prayer. Most merciful and almighty God, let your spirit which moved upon the face of the waters when there was no light descend upon me that from this darkness there may rise up a man to praise you. Brown abandoned the ministry in 1723 due to the sudden depression brought on by the highway robbery and returned to Shepton Mallet, where he continued to write, including books for children, translation of Latin and Greek poetry, and an abstract of the Bible. He published three theological works, A Fit Rebuke to a Ludicrous Infidel, A Defense of the Religion of Nature in the Christian Revelation, which is online. You can access this book. He wrote on the defense, the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity, and he also penned 1 Corinthians and Matthew Henry's commentary is listed in the preface to volume 6. And he died in 1732, and I can't find anywhere where this burden was alleviated. And that's a remarkable thing. 
But the thing that we need to take from this is when people are going through incredible trials, we can't be dogmatic and say that they have lived in great sin and therefore God has this crabtree cudgel waiting to beat them. As I hinted at last week, the description in the castle of giant despair is the verse I think of is 1 Corinthians 5, 5, being delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It was so brutal. And so if we're trying to help people, we have to, if the best that we can, we have to alleviate this burden that you've been a great sinner and therefore God is angry, he's full of wrath towards you, and this is why you're going through that. On despair, Cheever said, it is a curious picture which Bunyan has drawn of the intercourse between giant and his wife, diffidence. They form a very loving couple in their way, and the giant takes no step in the treatment of the pilgrims without consulting Mrs. Diffidence overnight, so that the curtain lectures to which we listen are very curious. You know, in other words, if we were a fly on the wall and we were listening to this conversation, but Mrs. Diffidence ought rather to have been called dame or desperation or desperate resolution, for she seems, if anything, the more stubborn genius of the two. And when the giant, very much astonished at the sturdy rogues hold out so long against his temptations and his beatings, brings a case to her at night for advice, she proposes his taking the pilgrims into the castle yard to show them the fearful heap of the skulls and bones of pilgrims who have been by him destroyed. Nevertheless, all would not avail utterly to subdue the pilgrims, though in deep misery. They waited still, and hopeful would still be encouraging his brother, though it seemed to be hoping against hope. Like as in the slough of despond at first setting out on the pilgrimage, they were unable to see the promises, or in dreadful, sullen unbelief refused to take hold upon them as being beyond their case. Charles Overton and his Cottage Lectures. Let me mention something about that book that's called Cottage Lectures on Pilgrim's Progress in 1849. I had narrated some of this work and I got contacted from a man who's doing a great deal of good on um, the internet. Uh, GraceGems.org is his website. And he asked me uh, about this book, and I would say that um, it's one of my favorite commentaries on Pilgrim's Progress, written by somebody who was an Anglican, but the insight definitely of a J.C. Ryle in his applications. The imprisonment of our pilgrims in Doubting Castle and what they suffered in it from the cruelty of despair and the machinations of diffidence is intended, intended to instruct us in several important truths. It represents to us a sad and distressing situation of a real Christian when having deviated from the right path and having sunk for a while into slothful negligence. At length he awakens out of it only to become the prey of despair. So too many of the commentaries make a real correlation between what they had done and the crabtree cudgel that awaited them and I'm just, I'm just putting in a caution at that point. But then he is driven, as it were, by a stern tyrant and made to dwell in desolate places as those that have been long dead. He is oppressed with the most dismal and gloomy doubts. He can derive no benefit or advantage now from the remembrance of his past experience because you would think at this point that something that God had done for them in the past would something, be something that he could recollect, that he could feast on, that he could remember that how is it that if God dealt with me this way at this river, that now he has completely abandoned me? And he's, they're not getting the benefit of thinking back on these experiences. But I'm saying we should. He is in the region of doubting, and he doubts everything. He doubts that his past experience was all a delusion, or he supposes that it was. Doubts that he ever prayed in earnest or ever received an answer to prayer in his life. He doubts whether he ever possessed a single grain of saving faith. And I talked about Christian and his fight with Apollyon. That's one of the wiles of the devil. He wants to drive you to agnosticism, questioning everything. 
and finally to apostasy, and he's not going to aim at anything less because he wants you destroyed, he wants your soul destroyed. So he doubts whether he ever possessed a single grain of saving faith and fears that he was deceiving his soul when he imagined that he was a child of God and a partaker of the Holy Spirit. Or else what is still more painful and distressing, he fears that he has sinned against the Holy Ghost, that he has committed the unpardonable sin, that his doom is sealed, and that there is no hope, no help for him and his God. When we talked about the uh, man in the iron cage, I made reference to how often Puritans had to write to assist people who feared that they had committed the unpardonable sin because they reflect too much on Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, Hebrews 10, 26, the five passages in Hebrews, the mention of uh, the blasphemy of the Spirit in Matthew 12. In my case, it was the verse, some men's sins go, po- go before to judgment, some men's sins they follow after. That you got books, for example, A Trial of a Saving Interest by William Guthrie, the Scottish Puritan, an entire chapter is devoted to this. I mention in William Googe's commentary on, uh, no, it's called The Christian Soldier, The Christian Warfare, out of 700 pages, 70 pages of that work is to get to the bottom of what this is. So I'm assuming, because people thought very deeply in those days as this is something that they had to assist people with a lot. But as long as he remains in this desolate place, his soul is deprived alike of meat and drink and light. Doubt deprives him of the spiritual food and sustenance which heretofore he derived from the word of God. Doubt robs him of the precious promises of the gospel which so often had been to his thirsty soul as rivers of water in a dry land. Doubt extinguishes the cheerful light that springs up from a sense of reconciliation with God and clothes every object around in gloom. But this is not all, though the prisoners of despair are involved in darkness and excluded from comfort all the days of their captivity. At certain seasons, they feel more severely than at others the power of their tormentor. Alexander White, in his characters from Pilgrim's Progress, when he talks about giant despair, all hope, abandon, was a writing that Dante read over the door of hell. And the two prisoners all but abandoned all hope when they found themselves in giant despair's dungeon. Only Christian, the elder man, had the most distress because their being where they now were lay mostly at his door. All this part of the history also is written in Bunyan's very heart's blood quoting grace abounding to the chief of sinners. I found it hard work, he tells us of himself, to pray to God because despair was swallowing me up. I thought I was as with a tempest driven away from God. About this time I did light on that dreadful story of that miserable moral Francis Spira. And I, I did tell you that story when we visited the man in the iron cage. A book that was to me To my troubled spirit is salt when rubbed into a fresh wound. Every groan of that man with all the rest of his actions and his dolors, as his tears, his prayers, his gnashing of teeth, his wringing of hands was as knives and daggers in my soul. Especially that sentence of his was frightful to me. Man knows the beginning of sin, but who bounds the issues thereof? We never read anything much like Spire's experience in grace abounding in giant despair's dungeon in the books of our day. And this man died in 1921. And why not, do you think? Is there less sin among us, modern men, or did such writers as John Bunyan overdraw and exaggerate the sinfulness of sin? Were they wrong in holding so fast as they did hold that death and hell are the sure wages of sin? Has divine justice become less fearful than it used to be to those who rush against it? Or is it that we are so much better men? Is our faith stronger and more victorious over doubt and fear? Is it that our hope is better anchored? Whatever the reason is, there can be no question but that we walk in a liberty that our fathers did not always walk in. End quote. But, I mean, I don't know what to draw as a final conclusion of that because I know he has a point and I know that the depths that you had in 
the writings of the Puritans, for example, I mentioned uh, volume nine of John Owen's sermons. He has a section called Cases of Conscience where he deals with the things. And I've personally narrated his commentary on Hebrews is 4,000 pages. And I narrated the observations of Owen on Hebrew 3, 7 to 19 about being overthrown in the wilderness and, you know, let us therefore fear and so on. His observations were 125 pages. And if you're in any kind of a spirit of declension, the warnings are so stark and... If you only meditate on that, I think that it could give itself to putting you into a spirit of bondage and fear. And I, again, I say to be continually in that state would incapacitate you to live the Christian life 